Shelly with the show live, local, topical, and relevant. And on the phone with me right now is my good friend. He is one of the greatest congressmen in the history of this country. His name is Jim Jordan. <laughs> uh, congressman Jordan, how are you, sir? I'm fine. Good, good to be with you, Shelly. Fifteen days before an election, where we're going to put President Trump back in the White House. So I'm feeling good. I. And I hope you are, too. But, uh, yeah, it'd be good to be with you. Yes, sir. And I, I believe, and you, you correct me if I'm wrong, you're closer to this than I am, but what I'm seeing since September 16th, I made the announcement on September 16th on my show that I believe this is not going to be close. I believe it's going to be a landslide. Are you seeing you can, anything that backs that up? Yeah, we were in Pennsylvania last week. We're, we're here in Georgia uh, this week and been all over the country. Uh, you can feel it building, and the polls are reflecting this just ever so slightly. It just keeps trending and moving in President Trump's direction. And that's because we get something we very seldom get in American politics. We get, we get back-to-back administrations, and you can do the direct comparison. You had four years of President Trump, four years of Biden-Harris. Well, which was better? We, I mean, literally, we went from a secure border to no border. We went from safe streets to record crime, $2 gas to $4 gas stable prices to record inflation, and I haven't even got into foreign policy. So everyone knows what we had under President Trump was so good. And then you compare it to the Biden-Harris, which I can't name one good thing that they've done. So I think this thing is moving in our direction for a whole host of reasons. Okay. Uh, I got you on uh, last minute. I appreciate it again. I know I said it to you, you off bet. air, but I'll say it again on air. I appreciate you coming on such last <laughs> mi- minute at the last minute. You dropped sure. the transcript of Nathan, Nathan Wade's um, yeah. cl- behind closed door <laughs> testimony. Two things jumped out to me. The first was the experience. Can you talk about that? Yeah, he had to go to Rico school. He's never prosecuted this kind of case the racketeering uh, statute never prosecuted anything like this. They, they, funny now, and remember this too. She she puts him and a few others to go, go figure out who we're going to have, who we're going to select to head up this case. She's working on that before she's even in office. So and the, and he's on this, and then all of a sudden they decide, well, you're going to be the guy, even though you have zero zero experience, you're going to be the guy to head this up. And, oh, you got to go to a school. I, know, I think this Floyd guy. you got to go to a school and learn about this statute and how you would prosecute a case using this as, 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 the, as the basis. So, uh, yeah, just uh, again. And this, is his own, this is his admission, not you, you yeah, saying this. This no. is his admission. His admission. This, this is questions he got from our key uh, uh, staff lawyers in the deposition a week ago. This is what he said. He said it started before she took office. And, of course, when I was ultimately selected by Fonnie Willis, the person that, by all accounts, he's having some kind of relationship with, when he's selected by her, that that he has to go to school to learn about uh, how you're going to prosecute a case under this statute. That's it. It's incredible because when we all said this, when – this went down. We all said the same thing. We were called. Well, I was called less than, and I was called, you know, a sellout and all these things because I was. Yeah. And it, people were saying that we were inferring that a black man, a black attorney, can prosecute a case. But as we see now, he he and he himself admitted he had no experience. The other thing that jumped out to me in this uh, transcript that you dropped this evening uh, was the the number of meetings he had with the White House. Did he talk about what went on in those meetings? No, he said he couldn't recall 60 times. Now, understand the backdrop here. He has an eight-hour conference call, eight-hour meeting. He built, cause, and he says it's eight hours because that's what he billed the taxpayers of Fulton County for, was eight hours of work, $250 an hour he bills for that. And then we said, okay, now what did you discuss with the White House? He goes, well, I, I don't recall. Who would you talk to? I, I don't recall. Was it a Zoom meeting? Was it, was it in person? Well, I don't recall. How about when you met with the J6 people? Uh, who would you meet with? I don't recall. Where did you meet? I don't – everything was – but I, we go, well, you billed eight hours. You took $2,000. In one case, it was the 24-hour billing for meetings over a couple days, and he couldn't recall anything. I think 60 to 58, 59 – so my 58 times, he said he – he didn't recall when he was specifically asked for things that he billed the taxpayers for. That, to me, is the most telling. Like, come on, man. Right. You're the expert. You're the guy selected. You go to school to learn about this. You're supposedly now the expert. You bill the hours, and you can't tell a squat who you talk to, how you talk to him, when you talk to him, what did you talk about. Nothing. He couldn't tell us anything. What and I understand. What I understand from that, or what I take away from that, is that clearly you had inappropriate conversations with the White House. If you cannot remember anything, I mean that's the way we see it on television, right? When people say, "Oh, I, I can't remember," that means they did something they not they weren't supposed to do. 
Well, maybe or just that they don't they don't want to tell us anything. They don't want to tell us that, you know, who did they talk to? Did they talk to one of the key lawyers on the January 6th committee staff? What did you talk about? What was you, they don't want to get into any of that. And so, I mean, maybe he just forgot. I'm not saying he did it, but it sure seems suspect that you can have an, a, a, one day. I think it was an eight hour Zoom call that, that supposedly took place and he can't tell us anything. Right. I mean, what are you I mean, you're meeting with folks with the January 6th committee and you can't tell us. Anything that was kind of a big issue at the time. Right. You, can't, you, can't tell, you can't tell us when you meet with the White House. We asked him, did you talk to anyone with the Justice Department? I don't recall. I don't recall if they were in the meeting. But like, he didn't recall. Any, like a meeting of that magnitude, like sometimes you might forget, oh, I had two meetings or three meetings. You might forget that. Right. But like you, you, don't, for, you don't forget like who you're talking to or you, you remember something about it. But uh, Nathan Way couldn't. And so should we, and okay, I'm a Trump supporter, you're a Trump supporter, right? We're talking to a lot of Trump supporters who are listening now, but there are a lot of people listening now who don't want Trump to be president. Can we all look at this and say, wow, this was a sitting president literally working with a prosecutor to go after his future opponent? I mean, based on the fact that he doesn't remember anything, can we just say what he did do because he can't tell us what he did not do? What he did admit to under under oath in the deposition was that if I billed for that, then it happened. If I recorded that and billed for that, it happened which meant that he talked with folks in the administration, which meant that he talked with folks associated with the January 6th committee. So we know that happened. What the details, what, the, what took place in those, he couldn't answer squat about that. So we do know that those things happened because he did testify to that. And if you look at the transcript, well, if I build for it, then of course it happened. Right. Uh, but he wouldn't give us any of the details. So, so then if you build for it and you had a meeting, you're the special prosecutor going after a guy running against the White House, the guy who's in the White House right then when you had the meeting. Right, so if you build for it and you had the meeting, you and, you're, and your only job as a special prosecutor, you weren't there as attorney nation Nathan Wade because you're so famous and you donate so much. You're there as a special prosecutor. You had to talk about the case. Yes or no? Well, we think it, we, well, certainly he talked about the case because he was billing for working on the case. Yes, what else exactly. was he going to talk about? You know, so, I mean, that, that, is, that, that, is, uh, that is, I think, clear just from his billing records. I think it was, you know, those three meetings. One, one was a 24 hours he billed for uh, based on that. That's where he talked with folks in other jurisdictions working on, um, on prosecutions. That was over a t- uh, several day period, I think a two or three day period, and he billed 24 hours, $6,000 to the taxpayers of, of Fulton County. Then the other two were relative to J6, uh, uh, folks associated with the J6 committee and folks associated with the White House. Those were two eight hour billings, $2,000 each. So of course he's gonna be talking about this. This is what he's working on. Right, and so we all are proven to be correct when we all said this is lawfare. All these cases are lawfare. All of them. Fonnie Willis's case is lawfare. Alvin Bragg, Jack Smith, and and they're all falling apart because they are those kind of cases. They aren't. They, I mean, you know, the case in uh, the, uh, the the case in Florida completely falling apart. The judge said this is ridiculous. She said that uh, Jack Smith wasn't even wasn't even properly appointed by the Senate for this task as special prosecutor. The case in D.C. The Supreme Court said, oh no, but you got to deal with this immunity issue, and and and, and that case seems to fall is falling apart. Alvin Bragg's case has completely fallen apart, even though they got the crazy uh, uh, verdict from the, from the jury there. And of course, Fonnie Willis's case has been a mess for, for a long time now. So yeah, these are all lawfare. But it, remember, the left is out to get this guy, President Trump, because he did what he said he would do when he got in office. And they've been out to get him since, since, he, since before he even got in office. Right. They spied on his campaign, then Mueller, then impeachment, then a second impeachment, then they raid his home, then it's the four indictments, then it's the 14th Amendment. And of course, not, not, you know, the other, the other things that have happened to this guy that are truly unbelievable are two assassination attempts, for goodness sake. Right. And through it all, through it all, this guy is made, President Trump has remained committed to fighting for we the people and doing what he's told us he's going to do when he runs for the job. My man, Congressman Jim Jordan, keep up the great work. I appreciate you, you, you again too, coming on the show. On the show, and uh, two weeks from tomorrow, we will be partying. We will That's be right. partying. I think you're right, brother. I think you're right. Thanks for all your good work. Thank you. Have a great night. Take God care. bless you. Take care. We'll be right back. Four four eight seven two zero seven fifty one eight hundred WSB Talk. 